and now we're going to switch to our next presenter, who is the Professor Ville Gurki from Aalto University. His talk is dedicated to artificial intelligence challenges for autonomous cars. Professor Ville Gurki, the, the screen is yours. I'm sorry, uh, you're muted. Okay, do you hear me now? Excellent. And then just a second to make sure that... Can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I will try to follow also the chat during my presentation but in case i'm losing something there will be some time for questions in the end but if if you have questions during the presentation don't hesitate to to ask during the presentation and uh, so my name is Ville Kyrki. i'm a professor at the school of electrical engineering in alta university and the leader of the intelligent robotics group and i'm also leading the uh, autonomous AI program in the Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence. And uh, uh, my background or, or my group works primarily in the, let's say, the software side of, of autonomy and robotics. And like uh, Sensim4 gave excellent introduction to the entire field. And I will be talking about a few particular observations about the current state of the art. And like they said uh, in their presentation, they, talk, uh, they mentioned that this, uh, the entire system for autonomous driving consists of three primary things. One is sensing, uh, second is thinking, and, and the third one is acting. So I will be talking primarily about the thinking, which is the domain of AI. And when we talk about AI, there are many, many, many brands of AI, from expert systems to logic-based systems, to machine learning systems, fuzzy logic and whatnot. And for, for the purposes of, of today's talk, when I'm talking about the AI, I'm talking about the current AI boom. And most of the current AI boom is based on data, vast amounts of data, so though that everything we want to learn is actually something where we have been able to for one reason or another gather vast amounts of data uh, often even from public sources already and we can turn that data into decisions the decisions can be uh, labeling images based on uh, people labeling their images in in uh, in, in the internet or uh, detection of people based on, again, huge amounts of uh, facial pictures in the internet to many other uh, domains. So data is really one of the primary drivers for the current AI boom. And today, uh, so, uh, so in, in this data-driven AI, when we talk about the data-driven AI, uh, you, we usually also use the term machine learning. So it will be today concentrating on the machine learning side of, of AI and it's used in, in autonomous driving and autonomous cars. So I will actually be talking about two different things. I will be primarily trying to talk about challenges to use AI. Why AI is not easy to be used as what Antti already earlier touched upon, the challenges due to uh, sometimes having difficulty with understanding what goes inside the black box AI that many of those data driven methods actually represent. Uh, but before I go to, to that, that side, uh, uh, to the challenges, um, I was planning to talk a little bit also about challenges that need AI, uh, especially in autonomous cars. So what kind of sub problems currently uh, require AI methods or where the, uh, the state of the art solutions are based on AI rather than some other probably more algorithmic methods. And uh, this is of course a very partial view and I'm only 
uh, putting up a few of the particular challenges, but, but this hopefully will give you still the kind of, uh, some kind of level of an overview and interesting pointers to uh, look further into. So maybe the most important driver behind the entire current AI boom is the uh, use of AI for perception. I think the current AI uh, deep networks boom started in computer vision a bit more than uh, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the, uh, with, with, with the birth of new types of neural networks, uh, but also not only new types of neural networks, actually uh, the methodological advances were not as big as the advances in the availability of data and computational power that we have in the modern graphics processors. So, so we were able to grind more uh, meaning out of vast amount of data, uh, while which was being produced to us even by uh, tech giants like Amazon give, having pictures of each of their products or uh, people uh, uh, putting images in social media. And uh, this perception is really a uh, uh, multifaceted thing, but most of the really areas where AI or, or let's say machine learning methods at the moment are so superior compared to, let's say, the traditional previous generation methods is perception. So for perception, AI is really uh, at the moment and, and machine learning is really the, the primary way to address these problems. So what is the perception then doing? This is an example from Waymo of what is uh, what can not only single sensor, but a set of sensors kind of grind out of, uh, uh, or what, what the system can uh, grind out of all those sensors. It can measure uh, other road users, such as humans, uh, other vehicles, uh, try to estimate the uh, traffic lights, estimate where the other road users are moving and so on and so forth. So, so in this area, we are already having pretty robust, uh, robust methods for most of the situations uh, with some exceptions. And uh, the challenge is for whenever we are doing any kind of learning uh, is the availability of, or, or this kind of data-driven learning is the availability of data. And for, for cases like detection of cars, we are starting to have already a huge amount of, of labeled data. But the, there are cases uh, which are not as common. And those are, of course, then the difficult cases. So uh, this is an example of a LiDAR scan from a car. Uh, can you guess what's this? So, so this is a real scan from a real car. Uh, or driving on the road. So if you can make any guesses, put them in the chat. Cyclists, any other guesses? Moose, anyone else want to try? Bridge on water? Dog and person? I don't have a correct, I have good answers, but I don't have a correct one yet. So this is actually a person on a horse. Something that is actually not very common. It's something that may happen uh, for a car once in a while, but it's really a rare occurrence. So how can we detect things that are probably not supposed to be on the road? How can we detect a flock of birds and understand how to act whenever we, uh, we encounter that kind of, in a way, out of domain uh, situations. Situations that are not present in traffic law. We don't have any kind of, of real, um, uh, real clear rules how to act on those. And especially because those are very variable. So we have stuff. Our environment has lots of stuff that is starting from um, um, your uh, odd uh, bag flying around in wind 
to to a person lying on the road to horse and a driver to a raccoon to whatnot and to in order for the system to understand how to act for those kind of kind of unexpected situation which are probably too complex such that we can ever gather enough data to be able to train a machine learning system to address each of those so if we could have a system that's able to detect all those situations on the road that might be a solution but in practice uh, the, 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 we have to be able to in addition to uh, to detecting um, uh, typical road scenarios, like being able to understand other road users that are supposed to be on the road, we have to be able to uh, categorize other stuff to things that we can, for example, we just should, should just wait until they go away, or, or like a herd of, of, of reindeer in the north of Finland, or we would, could do things like, um, the, to to uh, go around them because we know that they won't be moving or we could do just uh, drive slowly through them like some other uh, obstacles that either will scatter like a flock of birds or that are uh, not uh, uh, in any way dangerous for the car uh, or that they, they we can just drive over them and th that stuff is so variable that's kind of impossible to teach a rule for any and all kinds of stuff separately. So we have to be able to somehow cope with this unorganized, out of uh, distribution uh, things as well. So we have to be able to understand what are the kind of higher level categories, more abstract level semantic situations that we, uh, the system has to also cope with. Our current systems can already automatically, I mean, or may, not maybe ours, like out the universities, but we are looking at the state of the art systems, for example, from Waymo, they're already able to cope with all typical road scenarios. It's the atypical scenarios that are the problem. So now to something completely different and more towards, um, understanding situations uh, for, for those typical scenarios. And why is that difficult? And why is this decision-making uh, difficult? So here you have a top views of eight different road scenes where the blue block shows the position of the, uh, of the let's say the own car and the yellow block show um, um, the location of other vehicles in this uh, example, there are also some things like the, the red and, and green uh, lines show the location or where the path has been planned originally and so on. So we can represent these kind of situation and the, and the full variability with the situation, for example, like this top-down use of the environment. And uh, in order to understand this situation, we have to somehow be able to analyze this situation, which has a few complications. First of all, the, uh, in, in, in the, uh, so after we have even solved the perception problem, after we can construct this kind of situation um, image, uh, there are still a lot of variability here. And part of the variability in order for, in this kind of situation to make good decisions is the ability to actually understand not only what you are supposed to do, but how the others are, uh, are doing. So actually being able to predict based on, on these kind of situations, not only what you plan to do, but also what are other road users planning to do, maybe a crucial uh, thing that's actually uh, uh, allows planning. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, we can also try uh, uh, try to do automatically and for this kind of prediction currently our simple models that are based on uh, um, on control engineering and, and state estimation are probably and are usually not sufficient the variability of different situations 
is higher that can be captured with simple uh, models, which would, for example, assume that the car just continues with the same speed it's currently having because of this. So there's actually even an individual cars, they always, when you want to look at the real traffic situations, you want to predict how they move, but it's not only one prediction for each car motion, but we get multiple predictions. People work in pretty consistent ways. Uh, but for example, when we can consider this example, people could do on a motorway, way, they could do lane, uh, lane changes, but, or they could be not doing that lo those lane changes. And in order for us to plan good trajectories in that kind of environment, we actually have to cope with the variability of multiple different future predictions. And that's actually the, uh, and the reason why we have those so uh, multiple future predictions is peak. To cope with the variability of the traffic environments, not because the physics of the cars would be uncertain, but because the other road users are so uncertain uh, that they don't necessarily always use the, uh, the, the indicator when they would be changing lanes. They may do other unpredictable things. So uh, predicting uh, the future when there are multiple options and uh, is really difficult. And at the moment, it seems that if we just have enough data, then the machine learning at the moment seems to be uh, uh, most likely the best solution we have for these kind of problems. So, like I said, uh, for the same reason, actually, uh, imitating people in, uh, in order to choose what you want to do for an autonomous car will not be sufficient. That's also kind of um, quite clear from Auntie's final comments that it's not enough that we have cars that are as good as people we have to have cars, autonomous cars, that are better than people. And uh, in order to get to better, higher safety, we cannot just even, uh, we cannot just replicate what people do. We have to be able to have uh, ways to learn how to build uh, cars that are safer than the cars driven by human drivers. So that, when we now let's move to the challenges and the challenges to use an AI, uh, and the main thing that I have been talking all the time is data. And the big question then is, how much data do we really need? Uh, do we really need? So here's a one quite large number. Um, can anyone guess what's that? So that's actually the uh, number of kilometers driven by Waymo so far with their autonomous car. So they have been driving for 32 million kilometers in an autonomous, with an autonomous car uh, uh, around a few different states in US. So do you think that's a lot? And I guess that's more than what Sensible 4 has done, right? Can somebody confirm? You don't know, you need to say how many out of some magnitude, but I guess that's more, right? So do you think that's a lot? So that's a big number. So I'll give you a small number then next. Can you guess what's that number? That's not a reaction time, no. That relates to kilometers as well, somehow. That's actually the number of accidents in Finland by humans per kilometer. So there is five accidents per 100 million miles on average when a human driver drives in Finland. So we want a, the autonomous car to be better than human. It would need to be... Uh, uh, do less than five accidents leading to injury uh, in 100 million miles. So if you do a simple calculation, that means that with the average human rate, the 32 million miles should give on average 
injury-leading accidents. So suddenly the 32 million miles, oh sorry, 32 million kilometers is maybe not that much anymore because we would expect actually only one and a half accidents if a human would drive 32 million uh, kilometers. That means that actually, even if they have been driving tens of millions of kilometers, that's probably still not enough. I mean, that's still, uh, the amount of driving is 500 times around the world, but that's probably still not enough because actually people are pretty damn good drivers. So how can they then drive the, their cars? So I'll give you another number. So just to show that there is difference, that is 25 billion. Do you get, guess what's that? It relates to the previous number. That's the number of kilometers Waymo has simulated their car in. Most of the simulations are based on the 32 million kilometers of real life, but with some variation added in. So actually by, by adding different variations of the real world data, they, have been, they are now getting to a, a level where they can simulate something like 100 years a day of driving. So the 25 billion kilometers is something like daily trips to moon and back for 86 years. That's a pretty big number. So when we think about now the same observation with this, suddenly we would al already start understanding that okay maybe with that amount of simulation we are start we should start seeing those situations that would lead to accidents that cause injury so actually what we have now is the the and and a more important observation about these simulated miles or kilometers is that those can be targeted those can be targeted to those situations which we may be potentially flagged as somehow dangerous, close to accident situation, for example, in those original miles. So that this way, through simulation, we are actually being able to, at least partially, try to, gap, uh, to, to cross this great gap between the requirements of safety versus then the absolute, uh, the safety that we, uh, that, uh, that we, uh, or the amount of experience we can get. So that leads us to the point that maybe one of the most valuable things that Waymo currently owns is their simulation capability. Both their simulator, but actually also all the, uh, the, the infrastructure relates to the simulations that allows them to do the 100 years a day of simulation, because that way they can make their development processes so much faster so that they are able to use AI-based methods because they are able to validate it on huge test sets whenever they do any changes to the system, which is probably uh, not possible, uh, this kind of uh, stat uh, statistical-based uh, evaluation, unless you can do most of it in simulation. So simulation may be at least a partial solution to the data problem. So, but when we really can kind of jump back a little bit of when real problems happen, and this is actually not only the problem for humans, but also for, for AI is these things. When the problems start to accumulate, when there is a bad weather, there's a horse on the road and your other people on the same road have road rage. That's actually the cases when accidents happen. 
So when, when you get accumulated problems, you start, uh, your system start failing. And then even if you haven't been ab uh, able to decode the individual problems, it's extremely hard for any system to be able to cope with these kind of accumulated problems. So, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks, Christina. On also the sun is shining to your face, except that maybe less likely if you have heavy rain or snowfall, but yes, that's exactly true. Uh, so in order to try to somehow uh, address those problems, which are really something that we have, we are the unresolved problems, uh, which is probably also the reason why the way most services have opened for general public in Arizona, where I guess snowfall is pretty a rare occasion. I mean, uh, in California, in Los Angeles, you still have maybe uh, 30 days of rain a year, but, but Arizona, you have even fewer. So in order to build systems that can tolerate those, basically what you need is layered safety. You need multiple safety systems that, for example, in the simplest case, just means the safety is based on multiple sensors, such that you're not relying on any particular system to be able to cover for you. You need to have, in addition to this, the, you have to be able to understand also when the system goes, uh, goes out of its uh, operational design domain. So when the sensors are not any more reliable, you have to be able, uh, or when, your perception or when your predictions start to get unreliable. And that means that the data-driven methods that don't give any kind of uh, notion of their prediction confidence cannot be used, at least as the, uh, as the critical layer of safety. So I'm kind of going to um, now soon going to finish. So what I want to finish with is that uh, that in Alta, we also have recently started an autonomous car project where we are trying to address many of those problems that I have now mentioned, especially we are trying to, uh, across many groups, uh, uh, one of which is mine, we are trying to address uh, especially the, these uh, bottleneck problems, including safety, uh, as well as making uh, decisions on the different kind of uncertainty. So where, where my belief is that in order to build safe systems, we have to be able to see the effect and quantify the uncertainty of the all components of the system so that we are able to see whether the, uh, the data that flows from one part of the system to another part in the decision-making pipeline is reliable. And that means that there needs to be some kind of hierarchy of decisions or and, and also hierarchical planning and control that uh, that will be able to then address the system uh, the the entire problem so that uh, for example when we go out of the domain of the data we have seen when the one of the or when any critical sensor starts to fail we are able to see that and execute some kind of safety maneuver some kind of safety stop for example so this kind of concludes my talk, but to, to summarize, I think, I think that the main thing we are, uh, the challenge of, of AI for autonomous driving is the availability of day, uh, data at the moment, especially the uh, availability of data of rare occasions that cannot be, uh, where we always have a situation that may happen. And because the AI has hardly any notion of of uh, common sense. We cannot solve uh, the systems that are, uh, can be proven to work in those situations where we require common sense. So actually the systems needs to understand that it is, it is in a situation where it's going outside its domain of operation and then has to have a ways of, of failing gracefully. So that means that the car will stop, but uh, accidents can still be avoided. And that kind of concludes my talk for today. Thanks a lot.